In about a minute, we'll start. And it's, it's noon, so if all okay, we will we'll start. Um, I should say, Julie, are all your participants here or do we need to wait a little bit? If we could just give it one more minute, I just resent the link to Mary. So she will be on in just a minute. And I think my other person is Alice and she's, I think we can get going without Alice. She's kind of coming in later in the presentation. So that'll give her a little bit of time, but I would like to wait until Mary gets on. She should be on shortly. This is Kathy Kellogg. I did text the group that Alice is with me. Unfortunately, for some reason, my camera is not being recognized. So Alice is on by audio. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Kathy. I have that same issue with my camera once in a while. I don't know what, when it chooses to do it, but I'm not smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> I agree. I've had to reboot computers. Oh. So, uh, oh, we're still waiting for Mary though. Yes, she should be, uh, she should be joining here in just a second. She's just texting me. Uh, she's, asking for a password. Mm. She shouldn't need a password. You know, I don't think uh, so. I, I, Julie, I have that pulled up, so I'm gonna forward it to her quick. Okay. If that helps. She yeah, I've only done a phone. direct link. Yeah, I, that's the, I forwarded the one that John sent, or I'm sorry, Justin, sorry, Justin. No problem. I just, sent it, I just sent it to Mary. Oh, okay. She got it. Okay. Well, I will, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, share my screen if that's okay. No, hang on, Julie. Let me just do a general introduction okay. um, first so people know what they're connecting yeah. to. Um, so welcome to the quarterly conference calls for Life Circle South Dakota. Um, as many of you know who have uh, attended these calls, participated, we've been looking at diversity um, over the past about year and a half, and we're continuing looking at diversity and inclusion um, today. So I'm going to introduce um, Julie Ward, um, just introduce you, and then you would do the rest of the introductions. So welcome, uh, Julie, to the quarterly conference call. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here to speak with you today. I am joined by some colleagues. I'm going to share my screen here very quickly. There we go. Can everybody see that? All right. So I'm I'm just going to briefly list the, the folks who are joining me today, and then we each have a piece of this presentation. So then when we get to their part, I will ask them uh, to just share their name, title, and how long they've been at Avera. Um, but I am joined today with Alice Robbins, uh, who is an RN and case manager with Avera Hospice, Elena Cook, who's a certified healthcare interpreter and our supervisor of interpreter services at Avera, uh, Mary Thompson, who is our manager of hospital communications and interpreter services at Avera. And we are so pleased to be here today to talk about caring for vulnerable populations and how we do that through the use of language services uh, throughout a patient's care continuum, but also um, how we care for vulnerable populations at the end of life. So I'll get started. I'm gonna take the first few uh, slides and then I'll hand it off. But um, I would say if there are questions, I don't know how you do this in other presentations, if you have them post in the chat, if somebody's watching those, otherwise we'll just take questions at the end, whatever works best. Okay, so um, caring for culturally appropriate or providing culturally appropriate care 
for people is really, um, sorry, I'm going to go to this. There we go. Is real. There's really three key components. And as a health ministry of the Catholic Church, uh, for Avera, this is really core to who we are. Um, we are particularly called to care for people whose social condition puts them on the margins. So the most vulnerable populations, and that includes our immigrant and refugee patients and families. Um, so it, it really is about who we are at Avera. It's embedded into what we do every day. Um, and for me, it's the, the most important component. Uh, but it also includes education. And you're going to see in a later slide that the diversity at Avera does not yet represent the diversity of the communities we serve in South Dakota. And so um, a lot of our staff, our frontline care teams, are encountering people from cultures that they've not encountered in the past. And so providing culturally appropriate care, uh, providing care in a respectful and dignified way, understanding the differences of how that care might play out uh, for patients and families um, is important. And so education for our staff is one of our key areas of focus um, in how we implement DEI at Avera. So that's, we have three kind of key areas for implementing DEI at Avera and education of our staff is one of those. Uh, and then of course there's regulation components. So uh, the Affordable Care Act, CMS and Joint Commission all have regulation requirements around providing language services for patients at no cost to the patient. And so um, we do do education with our staff to ensure that they understand that there's no cost to the patient for providing these services and the services are available uh, for the patient um, upon their request or if our care teams feel that the communication is not as good as it should be, we will employ interpreter services at that time. So um, it really is these three components uh, that make up how we provide culturally appropriate care for our patients. So I'm just gonna very quickly go through some of the demographics. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, I'm focusing more on Sioux Falls. Many of you are probably going to be familiar with these uh, demographic slides, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. Uh, but this slide really shows the foreign born resident populations in Sioux Falls. Uh, and of course, we know by working with our partners at Lutheran Social Services and the Multicultural Center, as well as some of our agency partners, that a number of our adults that settle in Sioux Falls have a lower English proficiency uh, and also a lower literacy level in their own native language. Uh, so LSS, um, their latest uh, information reports that a lot of the adults settling here or that have settled here are benchmarking at about a fourth grade literacy level in their native language and have very little um, English language skills. Now we know that's not true across the board. We encounter a lot of um, patients and families who do have um, some English language skills, uh, but th that's pretty typical. It's what we experience as well. Um, so this is just an interesting breakdown of where a lot of our um, populations, uh, where they were born. Uh, these are the top 10. Uh, this is a slide that uh, kind of shows the ethnic diversity at Avera versus the ethnic diversity in South Dakota. And it's the slide I referenced earlier that shows, um, you know, we are not as diverse at Avera as we are in the state. Now, if you add up uh, the white population along with the American Indian pop population, that's about 88%. Um, and so don't need language services uh, for those two populations. Um, but we look at this as an opportunity to encourage people to get into healthcare. So we know there's a lot of um, youth uh, in our schools, and I've got some slides on our schools that are maybe not thinking about healthcare careers. And so we have a, a pretty significant focus here at Avera in our schools um, and in our workforce efforts to encourage people to seek out healthcare careers. 
Um, and so we just see this as a lot of opportunity, but it's also an awareness point for us to know that um, we have to be aware when we're caring for culturally diverse patients that we may not have all the education that we need. Um, and so we're always in a state of learning. This is just a, um, an updated slide uh, from 2021 on Sioux Falls School District. Of course, we hear this all the time in various reports that our schools are much more diverse uh, than the rest of the population maybe. So um, Sioux Falls Public School Districts reported 40.7 ethnic diversity um, as of 2021. So this is uh, this next slide that shows this language is spoken in the Sioux Falls School District is very representative of what we also see at Avera. And we'll cover that in some later slides. So 2,600 English language learners uh, and 79 languages spoken in the Sioux Falls School District. So I'm, um, before I hand this off to Mary, uh, this is our really incredible interpreter services team here at Avera. And we are very fortunate to have um, employed Spanish interpreters, um, two of whom are certified healthcare interpreters. And Elaine is gonna talk about why that is important uh, when we get to her. Um, but I made them pose for a picture so you could see them all. Uh, they are an incredible team and our care team really views them as part of the care team. They're an important piece for our patients. Um, they work side by side with caregivers. Um, and we are just so fortunate that we, we have them here at Avera. Um, I believe we also have another position open for a Spanish interpreter. Spanish is by far our number one language need at Avera. And I think Mary's gonna speak to that and, and show you some demographics or some graphs there. Um, so we are really fortunate to have our own Spanish interpreters here at Avera. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Thompson. She's the manager of interpreter services. So I'm going to let her talk about our policy, our partnerships, and our processes. So Mary, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, Mary, are you on mute? There we go. I am uh, Mary Thompson. I am the communication slash interpreter services um, manager, and uh, I also manage the switchboard. So I thank you for having us speak over this important topic. Um, I just wanted to make everyone on this call aware of Avera's interpreting and translating policy. The purpose of our policy is to establish a uniform policy for accessing interpreters and translators to assist in communication with patients who have limited English language skills, are blind, some are deaf and blind, or visually impaired, hard of hearing, or deaf. The policy is available to all of our care teams. In this policy, it states that we will provide these services at no cost to our patients and to their families. Over our Avera footprint, we utilize different equipment for um, our interpreter services. We utilize iPads and they have that has an app on it that we have dispersed throughout the hospital and a lot of our clinics and, and a lot of our other regions. Um, we also use, uh, we have a lot of minutes that are used over the phones where speaker phones are brought into a patient's room and an interpreter will be on one line interpreting for the patient and the physician. And then we also utilize our Bolt phones and they have apps for interpreter services. And all of these are helpful for uh, in-home traveling. Um, we currently have one vendor that we are utilizing uh, for our interpreter services app and over the phone services. They are called Propio. There is a second vendor that we are hoping to get uh, under contract within the next week or two, and they are called the Language Line, and that'll be a nice backup for some of these harder to, to uh, reach interpreters for some of our harder languages, such as Kunama and Karen, 
Uh, sometimes it's hard to find a, an interpreter for these languages. And um, in the demographics of Sioux Falls, those are languages that we see quite a bit of. Uh, we also utilize five local agencies for our outsourced interpreters. Out of these five agencies, two are sign language agencies. We have quite a population of hard of hearing deaf patients that come to Avera. Um, as Julie mentioned, we have our own Spanish interpreter department that currently includes two full-time interpreters and one PRM. However, we do have a budget to include hiring one more full-time and one more PRN for a total of five interpreters. We have a pretty good system set up to schedule an interpreter. You basically call the call center at 322-6888. Uh, you tell them your request for where and when you need an interpreter, the time and the date, and then they can they try to get it outsourced. And if they can't, then we, we advise the clinics to use the Propio iPads. Uh, one thing that is important for cost reasons is we do ask that if an appointment needs to be canceled, the patient's not gonna make the appointment. One request we have is that uh, you call us within a 24 hour time frame. Otherwise, Avera gets charged an emergency fee so that kind of ups the price of the hourly fees. With our current vendor, Propio, we have the ability to submit written translations. And that has come in handy, especially during COVID. I go into a portal that uh, they have created and submit the in Word document or however they I, I receive it. Uh, then it goes through the process, we receive a quote, and then I ask the person requesting the translation. If they approve, I approve it, and then the translation process continues until it's finished, and um, then we proceed with all the written translations. I just wanted to touch a little bit on the process for hiring uh, interpreter services and vendors is quite time-consuming. It involves several departments. There's IT, there's tips, uh, there's accounts payable. Um, and it, as you can see by some of these slides, our need for interpreters has grown immensely over the past five years and probably longer and continues to grow at a steady rate. Next slide, please. Here is a chart from fiscal year 2021 that shows our top 21 languages and what percent of minutes by language are used. So you can take a look at that. And as you can see, Spanish is, is definitely dominant, but we also have a lot of very rare languages and within some of those languages are different dialects. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Nope, okay. Next slide, please. So these are the requested languages that we had at Avera from uh, our fiscal year 2021. As you can see, the list is very long. It contains 86 different languages. Some of these, like I said, some of these languages actually have dialects within those languages. And it can be a very, it's a very hard process to find an interpreter that can interpret some of the dialects within, an, within a dialect. Um, we, we do have very strict qualifications that we abide by when hiring interpreters and vendors. Some of these audio visual languages are very challenging to find an interpreter. Actually during COVID, we, we, we lost quite a few interpreters from vendors locally and our vendors uh, that we hire for uh, video VRI. Not everyone can uh, just be an interpreter because they know how to speak the language. And there is so much more to being an interpreter than just knowing the language, especially a medical interpreter. So uh, with that, I have our expert that I'm gonna turn this next slide over to, and that would be Elena Cook. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elena Cook, and I am the, I have the privilege of being the um, supervisor for interpretive services 
And I am also a certified healthcare interpreter, and I have served AVERA for 16 years. So it is a great privilege for me to have this opportunity today to come and talk to you about our interpreter services and language access program. Um, as you can see by now, AVERA has a very comprehensive um, interpreter services language access. Uh, like Mary mentioned, they think we have implemented uh, technology throughout our entire footprint uh, to, for everybody to have access to video and remote interpreters. And um, I'm sorry, audio, yeah, audio and video remote interpreters. And um, so we're um, using one of our partners, and soon um, we're going to have uh, start a new partnership with Language Line. Um, we also have uh, great partnerships here locally with agencies uh, that come and provide services for us when the medical staff requires live or in-person in interpreters. And, um, and also we have our internal interpreter services department. So really we are very comprehensive and uh, we're very fortunate to have um, such a uh, we have covered all of our bases, basically, and so in that way, we're very fortunate because um, I don't think uh, all the healthcare systems have such a great program like the one we have here in Navera. So as, um, uh, our team includes, like Mary said, uh, so hopefully soon five interpreters, and most of us are, um, or at least two of us are certified, and what that means is that we have been um, tested. Uh, we have been um, for we have been evaluated, uh, and uh, so that includes evaluating how we perform with very important aspects of this profession, and um, those. Um, Aspects that are very important are, for example, the accuracy of a translation uh, or interpretation and um, being impartial in, in every situation that we are in, uh, keeping our patients confidentiality, um, treating our patients with respect, um, having professional boundaries, and in some occasions, if it's necessary, we um, advocate for our patients as well. Um, we, uh, certify, as certified interpreters, we abide by the national codes of ethics and the standards of practice for healthcare interpreters. They have been created by um, the International Medical Interpreter Association, by the national codes of ethics and the standards of practice for healthcare interpreters, and also the California standards uh, for healthcare interpreters known as the CHIA standards. Um, so like Mary said, um, we do have challenges regarding uh, right now interpreter quality. Um, we have set pretty high standards for our internal staff because we have control over that. Um, however, we don't have a lot of control over the standards set by, um, by other language providers. So um, most people, there is a common thought that a bilingual person can be an interpreter. And this uh, is a common thought that um, stems from people not really understanding the profession. They don't, they don't understand really all the skills that are required. Um, and interpreting requires a huge amount of mental focus and uh, short-term memory capacity and um, a lot of processing uh, amounts of information and creating equivalent an equivalent message uh, into the other language. Um, and again, um, there are things that we need to keep in mind, like um, the accuracy of the message. Uh, we are trained to use uh, several techniques for that and um, to be impartial. Um, so it is, it is very important and really the, uh, the, this, the, this stem from, from thought that, uh, to just, uh, 
people not, not, not understanding our profession. So and it's common to hear uh, this coming from, even from our internal staff. Um, for patients, they sometimes don't understand what it takes and what benefits. Um, what, what are the benefits for them? And, um, and really our, even our agency interpreters um, have, don't have a proper understanding sometimes of the responsibility that is placed uh, for them, before them uh, when they are acting as interpreters. Um, and the sad truth is that when we don't provide a qualified interpreter, really the most affected is um, our patients because they are the ones at a disadvantage. Uh, like Mary mentioned also, we um, have recently have even more challenges because um, of COVID. When COVID hit, we lost quite a bit of interpreters. And, um, and now with the new requirements, we're losing even more. So we are constantly being challenged um, from that from that side of things. Um, and I, I wanted to share a story with you today, but before I do that, I wanted to ask if you have any questions. Elena, um, could you talk a little bit about, before you share your story, uh, talk a little bit about what you as an interpreter do when you encounter maybe a diagnosis that you're not familiar with and, and that process for ensuring that you can appropriately interpret for that patient and provider? Absolutely, Julie, thank you for the question. Uh, and this is where um, accuracy, which is what is one of our principles comes into, into play. Um, again, since we uh, practice um, or abide by our national codes of ethics and standards, um, we are um, so we are required to, if we don't understand something, um, we, one of our, our biggest things is that we need to keep the providers all on, and the patient all on the same page. There should not be any confusion. And so if there is something that I don't understand, I will, um, there are ways to ask the patient to stand by for a minute while I ask the doctor for a clarification. Um, and as long as I do that, um, if the, the doctor can explain it to me and so I can understand it better so that I can in that way understand it to the patient, uh, explain it to the patient, excuse me, to the patient. Um, but yeah, so that is what it, it's very important, uh, Julie and everyone to be tr uh, properly trained um, as an interpreter because um, again, knowing um, the standards of the profession can help interpreters navigate different um, and new situations like the one that you just mentioned, uh, because we are working with very um, highly educated people, very skillful and brilliant, really. And so that's one of the most fun things about, about our job. But that also brings challenges to us because uh, sometimes the language that is normal for them is not normal for us. So we need to have the uh, uh, the confidence and the humility to um, ask providers to please uh, explain things in a, in a way that we can actually understand and that we can actually um, explain it to the patient as well. Because if we don't understand it, uh, if we don't understand it, our patient is not going to understand it. And this is another um, thing, uh, actually, that uh, ties directly to being an advocate for our patients. Uh, sometimes, even though interpreters understand the message that is being said, um, our responsibility is also to monitor the, the patient, to make sure that the patient is also understanding what um, the doctor is the provider is saying to them. And if we have um, any thought or any concern that the patient is not understanding, then we are responsible for speaking up for the patient and that way we're advocating for them. And we, we have ways to do that as well. And, um, and that is something common and it's, it's never been a problem with the provider or patients at all. Thank you, Elena. And I, I think something else to just keep in mind too, that when we talk to in some of our other interpreters, 
Um, for instance, we have a Kunama interpreter who um, explained that being an interpreter, uh, especially in a language like Kunama, is there are so many words in the English language that have no, um, uh, no counterpart in Kunama. And so when Elena talks about interpreters needing to be very um, focused and be able to take in information and, and translate it to, or interpret it to that patient, in some cases, especially in the case of like Kudama, they're taking information and they have to figure out how to, in some cases, tell a story uh, using the Kunama language to impart information because there aren't equivalent words. Um, so imagine having to do that with very complex medical terminology uh, and concepts. And so it does take uh, somebody who is specifically trained to be a really qualified medical interpreter. And uh, we talked a little bit about the process that uh, we go through here. And I can't overstate uh, how um, fortunate we are to have the caliber of interpreters um, of Elena and her team here at Avera, because we don't see that across the board. And despite the regulations that CMS, Joint Commission, Affordable Care Act have out there, there aren't standards um, that are well followed across the nation. So we see a lot of variability agency to agency, interpreter to interpreter. Um, and we try very hard to ensure that the interpreters that are coming to Avera from the agencies have a level of knowledge and competency that they can inter interpret really complex dialogue. Uh, and we try to do a lot of quality assurance to ensure that that's happening and address situations as they um, come to light. But it is a constant um, process. And, Thank you, and Elena. Yeah, Luann here. I have just, a, I think, a companion question, which I, I think I can anticipate um, the response. But, um, you know, we try and be culturally appropriate and respectful of all of our patients. And although I can't think of a, an example, um, I can imagine there are some times when we may say something that is not culturally appropriate. Um, would the interpreter do one of those timeouts and clarify that with the, the medical team about, you know, you shouldn't say it this way or how would you approach that? Well, that is an awesome question. Uh, I, I do have to say, uh, Luann, I thankfully, um, our team of medical staff are incredibly compassionate. And um, uh, they, um, I mean, I have been throughout these years, that's one of the reasons why I love this job, because I um, take my patients um, and work with these uh very intelligent and brilliant people, but at the same time, they're so compassionate and caring. So that's not really something that I come across a lot. However, we as interpreters are responsible um, to advocate for our patients and also um, to talk about cultural awareness, right? So I have come, I have only a couple of, well, a few times in my career have heard um, providers Say to a patient, well, you have been here for this many years, you should speak English, or why don't you speak English? Um, I think I normally do not interfere because I um, I don't know where, where the provider is coming from with that question, and at the end of the day, um, it is the provider's question, and um, as far as long as uh, and actually, my patient has the right to answer to that question, right? I can't say, oh, wait a minute, uh, and use my um, required steps as an interpreter uh, to say, I don't think you should say that. Um, because the patient also has the right to hear everything that is being said and how it is being said. And the patient also has a right 
to answer to that, you know, that question that is being asked of them. I do have to say, I always feel uncomfortable with that question, um, but, but I'm not a judge. And um, as long as we don't enter into an argument that it's going to cause a lot of stress, um, then, and that has never happened, by the way, usually the issue dies there. Um, I know that it annoys my patients. I do know that they have expressed it before. And I had an opportunity to mention that to uh, a team who, who, who were asking me about um, microaggression, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's the only example I can give you. And uh, as long as it's not, I mean, if it's something offensive, but again, our team of experts here have, have are, I never had issues at all, except for, for that. And I, I that answers the question, Luann. And I would say too, Elena is um, really good when she does encounter that question or something like that. She um, has such a diplomatic way of communicating that back to us and so that we understand there is an opportunity for education uh, either with a, a provider group, uh, a department. So um, we know we, we continue to uh, address issues as they come up. And um, as Elena said, the most important piece is ensuring that the patient has the information and the right to answer and, uh, and then we can address it on the back end if we, if we need to. Um, Elena, another thing that maybe you could speak a little bit about um, is, because I know this comes up and you spoke about it to the ethics group is, you know, occasionally we will encounter situations where the patient or the family is requesting an, a family member interpret or they don't want the interpreter in there or there's a challenge between two family members. Can you speak a little bit about how you handle that as an interpreter? Yes, absolutely. And like I mentioned before, that, that really stems from people um, maybe misunderstanding our profession as, an inter as, as interpreters. Um, in fact, we, uh, Mayor mentioned our policy, and we do have a policy um, that where it, it clearly states that, um, that sometimes patients prefer to have their daughter or their son interpret for them because Sometimes that has been allowed before, and so they think they can continue to do that, and then they come to Avera, and then we have uh, more strict rules about that because that is actually, um, and that shouldn't happen um, because we know that when a family member or a friend or anyone who is not a professional interpreter acts as an interpreter, a lot of the information is, is, is lost really and um, and so even patients don't understand that and many times um, after a patient is refusing a professional interpreter when when we are done with um, the session they actually say wow this was so much better you're such a great interpreter because now they have seen what what a professional interpreter can do um, but as far as the requirements that we have, we, um, when a patient is there and they, they state that, then we talk to the medical staff and um, normally the medical staff would say, they want an interpreter, they want someone there because they understand the implications of not having one. And so we explain to the patient that this is a service that is provided at no cost for them that the family member is, or friend or whoever they want to be there can be there and be, and be part of the conversation, but the interpreter uh, will interpret. Now, if, that is, if they still refuse to do that, then the last step is to allow uh, a family member to act as an interpreter, but the professional interpreter hired by Avera should also remain in the room um, as the medical staff interpreter to ensure that the information is interpreter is correct. Now, I have never gotten to that point. I have never had to stand there and just listen to a conversation. Thankfully, because most of, uh, most of my patients, um, the very few actually that have that kind of request, they accept to have 
an interpreter. Thank you, Elena. That's a good question, Julie. I have a question. Um, I think it sounds like you're a Spanish interpreter, and I know that I think Julie you mentioned that most of the interpreters are Spanish language, at least in person. Um, I think with how prominent kind of um, gender neutral or transgender patients are that don't use the traditional she, her, or he, him pronouns and with Spanish being as gendered of a language as it is. I'm curious how you approach that because I know people use the term like Latinx, but that's not really feasible to do with all of the language in Spanish. And so I'm curious if you've encountered that or if there's kind of professional guidance on how to address that within the Spanish language. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question as well. Um, yes, you are very right when you say that if the Spanish language is either feminine or masculine, everything, even a table or a microphone, have a gender. So you're correct on that. Um, as far as um, your question goes with our patients, um, we don't we don't see a lot of gender. Um, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of patients who are going through gender um, changes or um, who are, um, uh, yeah. So, so we don't we don't deal with that a lot. Um, but when we do, um, yes, we we are required to know all the pronouns that go along with that, and um, and if we have to use them, we we're fine with that. But again, to be honest, I personally, um, having, come, having come across a patient who has a gender change or is going through a, um, a trans, transgender uh, cha uh, change as well. So. And I can speak to that a little bit too. So uh, we just recently, as of June of this year, um, now have gender fields in our EMR so that we are able to capture um, a person's uh, legal name, their preferred name, their preferred pronoun. Um, patients can self-select that in our patient portal. And so um, part of that is so that when we are caring for our gender diverse or transgender patients, we do have the knowledge that we need up front to ensure that we're providing a respectful and dignified experience for that patient. Um, but it also lends itself to providing the, the quality care we want to provide. So, you know, for instance, if the patient is a trans man and that patient has not undergone uh, lower body surgery, there's a chance that that patient could still be pregnant. And so if that patient is going to be going through um, some type of scans, x-rays, we do need to be able to ask that patient in a respectful way if the patient could be pregnant. And so um, to Elena's point, we hope that when we see that patient, especially if we're seeing that patient for the first time, that we have all that information up front so that we can provide that, um, that right level of care for the patient. Um, and we have seen as we've, uh, as since we've added those fields, um, we've heard from our care teams and our families that that has helped immensely. So thank you for that question, it's a great one. Okay, I've hijacked a lot of your presentation, Elena. So I'm going to let you finish with your with your story. No, that's that's great, and I appreciate all the questions. Um, absolutely. So you know, one of the, the wonderful things about serving Avera as a as a medical interpreter is that the the opportunity to experience what our patients experience and to see our providers at work. And so I just have a story for you that it really um, it had I, I it happened about 13 years ago, and I to be honest I I still remember as if it was today. Um, this was a patient. I'm gonna call her Maria because I I don't like to call people by patients or not knowing their name. So <clears throat> so Maria was a patient who was pregnant and she was about <clears throat> almost full term actually, and she she came to the clinic for a regular checkup and. Um, well, I was so we were just waiting in the waiting room, and uh, like all this, like any time we went to the doctor, we we're just talking and chatting. And um, 
So she was pulled in and um, it was a normal, as you know, you go to the doctor, they want to listen to the baby. <clears throat> so we were listening to the baby and it happened that the doctor noticed that the baby's heart was hardly there anymore. And so the sound was really distant and fainted. So they um, told her that there was, they were not sure what was going on. So um, they wanted to bring her to the um, labor and delivery room. And this was all on plan. And uh, so the, the, her husband actually had gone downstairs um, to, um, to an appointment with his son. And uh, so we had to call him and tell him to come quickly to the clinic. Um, but so we took her and um, actually the doctors were very nervous and very stressed at that point and they kind of rushed her to the labor and delivery from Plaza One. The, um, the, the way there seemed like it was forever because um, they needed to get this patient to the operating room as soon as possible because they actually were thinking that the baby was dying at that point. Um, so, uh, we rushed into the, um, operating room and of course there were so many things that happened in between, but, um, a whole team of people were there present in the room. The NICU came down and, um, and we took, uh, you know, they had to put the patient to sleep and, uh, it took a long time for, um, actually the, it seemed like a long time for a C-section to be performed, so, but, um, and I was helping the husband, both of them, but the husband at that point was the only one awake, the, the, the I mean, the, the mom was already asleep and the husband was awake, and he was actually kind of shocked about everything that was going on because it was so sudden and unexpected, um, and after what it seemed a long time, um, the doctors were able to pull up the baby. Um, and when they pulled up the baby, actually the baby looked completely blue, like like completely blue. And I, I remember just standing there and uh, next to the dad and he was, he was, um, he seemed like he was in a different realm at that point. He wasn't really speaking. He was kind of holding his breath and kind of shocked about the whole thing. Um, but then, so what, they took the baby out and and um, I started to give the baby CPR. And it seemed like minutes went by. I'm sure there were just seconds. And uh, finally, uh, the baby took his first breath. And, um, and then uh, slowly the color started to come back. Um, and... Um, and then the baby was taken to the NICU, um, and, but, and eventually the baby was discharged, and I actually got to see this baby grow. Um, at, at the beginning, they didn't know if this baby was going to have brain damage because of the lack of oxygen. I'm making the story very simple, um, but it was actually very emotional, and a lot of things went on, but for the sake of time. Um, and... Uh, I actually had the opportunity to see this baby until he was around 10 or 12 years old, and he never had any brain damage from this situation. Um, but the thing, I, I just remember going home and I was reflecting on what had happened that day. I was actually involved with this family for most of my day here at work, and um, two things kind of shocked me, and, and one was um, the uh, focus, that amount of focus and skill that our medical staff had at that time, even though they were, this was such an emergency and um, there was a potential for this, for losing a baby. Um, our medical staff was incredibly caring and, and focused and I was amazed at that. And um, I, w I was just thankful that I didn't have to see um, a baby die that day. I, I, had, I had gone through that before with patients, and um, I just concluded that I had seen a miracle, that um, that was a true miracle. So um, 
And the reason I'm sharing this story is because uh, as, as in-person interpreters, we call ourselves in-person interpreters because we are there present, um, we really uh, support our patients. Um, we are, sometimes we are a constant for them, the only constant for them. They go from, from one specialty to another and to another, or they um, continue to come back and they, we build a relationship with them. And of course, at the meantime, as um, professional interpreters, we need to keep professional boundaries as well. But that doesn't mean that we cannot have a, a relationship with our patients. Um, so that this is the stories like these are are, are the ones that are the reward and um, what what keeps us interpreters committed to this profession. And um, we we are kind of at the at the gate here. Um, we want we want um, we know that that this is a service that is needed, and uh, but we also want it to be, to be good because um, Avera in general um, has, has really high standards, and we have also um, created high standards for us so that we um, can, um, can help of our interpreters to receive uh, the same care that is given to everybody else. Um, you know, when, when a patient and, and provider um, are facing each other, there are many things that can separate them, but our job is, our, is, to, our job is to bring them to a the same level by um, being an agent uh, of communication and understanding and serving that way so that um, our providers don't have to worry about that aspect because we are there to fulfill that part, and so they can continue to provide the same level of um, care that they are used to providing for our patients. Thank you, Elena. Thank you for sharing that story. And thank you for all the information. Wow. That was great. Um, does anyone have any other questions before we move on to Alice? All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so culturally appropriate care at end of life um, is a, it's just really an incredible um, story. And, and we met with Alice and she shared some information for, with us. Uh, and so I'm gonna let Alice introduce herself and then she's gonna um, talk about what it's like to care for um, persons at the end of life who um, are from different cultural backgrounds and she's got a great story to share as well. So Alice. Hello, my name is Alice Robbins. I am a nurse with hospice. Uh, my background is I did over 30 years in Avera's emergency department and I've been doing hospice for about 10 years. Uh, my goal for a hospice patient is that their death be the way they want it to be, but I like to focus instead of on their dying, I like to focus on the quality of their living and try to make it be as good as it possibly can be each day. Um, it's much easier to do when our patients are going to live a period of time, um, particularly ones that are from different cultures. It's hard for them to just immediately put trust in someone that they can't even uh, speak to. Um, many of them don't speak English. There'll be a, someone in the family that speaks English and some that don't at all, and they'll have to have somebody come over and help them. Or we can use a, a something like the language line um, if no one speaks English, but it takes a little bit longer to develop that sense of trust and um, 
faith in what I'm saying and that I am there to be on their side to have things go the way they want it to go. So um, she asked me to give you, you know, an example. At the time that I was seeing uh, a Bhutanese lady, I, I also was caring for an Ethiopian man and um, a Ukrainian woman. So it was kind of a multi multicultural time uh, going from one house to another. Uh, the Bhutanese family was particularly interesting to me. Um, they were always telling me, thank you, thank you for helping them. But I thought to myself, I should be thanking them because I learn as much from them and they're teaching me while I'm there about their culture. Uh, this particular one uh, was the grandmother. And in their culture, uh, a grandmother is uh, highly valued and highly respected. So people came from all over the nation to visit her fairly regularly. And I could always tell when the visitors were there because whoever came to the door many times was dressed in what appeared to be quite fancy clothing. Uh, I'd say three fourths of the family did not speak English, but when I came to the door, they would holler out, Doctor here. <laughs> and, and I just finally stopped. I just gave, gave up and just let them say that. Uh, for them to understand the difference between nurses and doctors. And I just thought it was more important to focus on helping this woman. So uh, they, they began to um, think of you as a healthcare provider that has come for the whole family. And so we had uh, four generations of the family living in this household, including small children. One day I came and she says, baby sick. And, and then I said, oh, well, take baby to doctor. I did baby sick. And so I tried to help her figure out what she could do, you know, to help her baby. Baby had long, long hair about down to the waist and uh, then the next time I came, baby was better and she'd been giving this Tylenol and ibuprofen and things that I've been recommending for this baby. The, about two weeks later, I came and they had little bowls uh, um, in a circle on the floor and smoke was coming out of some of them and people were sitting around these bowls. And I thought it was some kind of a religious um, thing. And uh, so I went to the one woman that I always spoke with, who was uh, the patient's grandson's wife. And she was always cook cooking when I came, always cooking. And then she always wanted me to taste. And then the entire family would laugh at the look on my face after I tasted whatever they offered me. Anyway, um, this was a part of their culture that when you turned two, all little boys had their hair cut, their first haircut. And the child that had been sick earlier was not a girl, it was a boy. And the little boy came out in a little boy's haircut. And this was a celebration <coughs> of their culture. Um, and again, it was an education for me to be included in that, to understand the differences in their culture. They have arranged marriages. So that this woman that spoke to me each time that I came helped, helped to educate me all about the arranged marriages and how that worked, if you liked it, if you didn't, and what to do. Uh, so uh, 
whatever I offered them, they offered a lot to me in education. But I grew to love going to that home. Um, and grandma would smile every time I would come in. Um, and, you know, as her health declined, we would try different things to try to make her feel better. Then the family was happy because grandma was continuing to feel better. So at some point, I took care of her for about six to nine months. And some time, I would say maybe a couple months before she died, all family from all over the country came to celebrate her. And it wasn't her birthday, uh, but it was some kind of a cultural celebration of her. And that's where this picture that you're seeing came from. She was sitting on the love seat where I usually found her. And uh, the women were all in fancy dresses and they wore, they had, uh, they had little bowls with smoke coming from it again on the floor. And the men were kind of sitting around that. And the women had this odd paint and they were putting little dots on grandma's face. And then they said, you sit. And, and I said, okay. I thought, okay, I'll sit. I'm not sure why I was sitting, but they said, you sit. So I sit down and then uh, I asked the woman who, who explained things to me what the dots were about. And she said each dot, you know, meant something different. And she explained each dot to me. And then they said uh, that I needed dots because they valued how much I had helped grandma. So pretty soon I started getting dots by sending my grandma. I started getting dots. And then, then they say, picture, picture. Uh, they wanted a picture of grandma with me. And it was, it, it was touching to me. It was enlightening to me. Uh, but it, it also made me a little envious of their culture, how much they valued that elderly woman. She was just treasured people literally sat on the floor around her feet uh, and uh, they really treasured her. Uh, another interesting fact about that was when she died, uh, they asked me to come over to see them and all of the family was there, but there were some that Weren't mis were missing that I normally saw there. And so I asked about them and I don't remember the reasoning, but for three days, some of the women had to stay in a separate room. So it's like one more cultural thing uh, about the Bhutanese that I, I learned about that day uh, and helped me uh, realize that when I go to someone's home, I must accept their culture and learn of their culture in order to be able to help them the best way that I can. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a, a real privilege for me to be able to do that. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Alice? Thank you, Alice. Thank you for sharing that welcome. story. Oh, sorry. You're very welcome. All right. Okay, well, I think this is our, our last slide. I just wanted to share with everyone that um, we continue to try to reach out to our immigrant and refugee communities and I don't know if all of you are familiar with a gentleman by the name of Moses Idris. Uh, he's kind of Sioux Falls famous now. He's, uh, there's been several articles about him, uh, Dakota News, Kelloland. 
uh, USF, the Argus, they've all done uh, features on him. Uh, Moses is uh, a Kunama refugee, and he's been uh, here for about 10 years. And uh, he, he came to us as a DEI intern, and he is now our community out outreach consultant, the first person in this role. And Moses is helping us build trust with our immigrant and refugee communities. Um, he's doing outreach with youth. He has a very special place in his heart for the youth in his community. Um, he started a Kunama soccer league for children who um, do not have the resources to play soccer uh, at the club level. And so through his work there, uh, he's helping us with workforce development and uh, some healthcare outreach. Uh, and we now have a second position that we are hiring um, uh, that has some contacts with some of the different immigrant and refugee communities. So this is work that we are really committed to at Avera. We want to continue to build trust with our communities that we care for. Uh, and, and hopefully that will help uh, improve health outcomes and, and just broaden our community that much more. So uh, with that, um, if anyone has any other questions, we're, all, we're happy to answer. Otherwise, I think we're, we're at an hour. So I think we've used up our time. Just pause and see if there are some questions. And I don't see any in the, the chat, um, but I truly thank you, Julie, Elena, Mary, Alice, um, for all the information um, uh, to learn about uh, the diversity interpreters um, in general and, and all that Avera is doing is, is wonderful. So we thank you for taking the time. And uh, I'm sure is a very busy day um, to help us. Um, it was recorded so that um, if you know of anyone who would like to listen to it, um, Justin uh, can send the link out um, and he will do it to our list of uh, historical participants. Um, so one last call for questions before we adjourn. I have a question too, but I already asked one to the translators, <laughs> so I didn't want to monopolize the time and it might be on the scope of today. Um, I guess a lot of the diversity talk, we talked about like ethnicity and language um, and even religious kind of diversity. And I didn't hear much about kind of patients who come from gender or sexual minorities. I know I asked the question about language and I'm curious, um, I think especially with Avera being a historically religiously associated organization that might feel unwelcome to people from those populations, what the institution is doing to kind of mitigate that kind of risk of feeling unaccepted. Yeah, that's a it's a great question, and I think we are we're in a constant state of um, educating and learning. Um, you know, we have a, a focus on ensuring that all patients who come to Avera for care uh, are treated respectfully um, and in a dignified way. And so um, we have a relationship with some experts in in Sioux Falls that we work with um, on education. Uh, we provide education to our, our staff on a case-by-case -case basis, but also um, in larger groups. Uh, when we implemented the gender fields in the EMR in June, uh, Mary Hill, who's our uh, uh, executive uh, mission leader, uh, she and I have done a lot of education to our leader groups and our frontline staff on not just on how to utilize those fields appropriately, but also how to have that respectful dialogue. So providing appropriate scripting for our team so that uh, when patients come to us for care, um, we're providing that care in a, in a manner that makes it comfortable for both the patient and the provider. And I think, you know, for a lot of our care teams, um, it's new. I mean, that it feels new. Uh, they're, they're just learning the terminology. And we know from working with the transgender and gender diverse community that that, that terminology changes on a regular basis. So we do our best to keep up with that um, by working with professional organizations. So um, it is a constant state of learning. Uh, we address situations as they come up. And um, I have found, and I've been doing this education for a while with our staff. Um, and I find that for most of the folks that we work with, people come at it from the standpoint of they really, really want to provide that respectful care for patients. And so 
they're, they're worried they're going to make a mistake. They don't want to offend somebody. And so we felt that the scripting uh, and working one-on-one -on -one with our care team is the best way to approach that. So um, it's just a, we're, we're learning uh, as we care for our culturally diverse patients, as well as our gender diverse patients. And um, it's a continual work in progress. That's so a great question. Thank you. And actually, we hope to have a, a quarterly conference call specifically for the LGBTQ plus um, and look at, at um, that type of education, knowledge, acceptance. So, yeah. And I would say, too, if, if for those of you on the call, if you're not aware, there is a gender or um, uh, a gender summit tomorrow uh, that is being held uh, by the Transformation Project, was an, which is a nonprofit in town. Um, I attended it when they had it last year. It's a wonderful conference. So if you are able to attend it, it's tomorrow. Uh, it's both virtual and in person. Uh, and I know they record it as well. So if you miss it, I think you can pick it up. But really great information. I did want to say just um, please include me on that quarterly call. But I will say that, that I know that conference doesn't have a speaker on end of life issues for the LGBT people because they had asked me to do it, but then couldn't get the CME done in time. Um, but I'm just, I guess that was more my question of like, are there things like pronoun pins or pronouns and like email signatures or land acknowledgements or anything system wide that Avera has put into place? And it sounds like y'all are kind of with Sanford where it's a little still more reactionary rather than proactive at this point. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on our education and, and really starting there with our staff. We felt that was the, the place to start. Yeah. Well, good and, and good discussion and, and thoughts for future league quarterly conference calls. So again, thank you, Julie and team. Um, and uh, Merry Christmas to all. Thank you. Thank you all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you.